somebody suggested that maybe we've all been abducted. That's what I was just saying. Maybe we we all get abducted. They're taking our DNA, whatever they're doing medically to us, right? Some people remember, some people don't. Joining us is Terry Lovelace, a man whose life took an unexpected turn during a camping trip in June 1977, where he encountered aliens. Well, Terry, thank you so much for being here. I am so excited to talk to you. I've watched every alien documentary there is, at least I think I have. And um, you have actually had an encounter with an alien or aliens. Um, I didn't want to do too much research on you because I wanted you to tell your story, um, sure. tell my audience your story, and uh, we could just start from there. Uh, exactly what happened? Um, I had an experience when I was eight years old. Uh, my family, I, I was born in East St. Louis, uh, and then we moved over to the other side and lived in a in a you know red brick row house in St. Louis City. And I was in my backyard, tiny little backyard, tiny little house. Um, and I'm playing with this bow and arrow, right? And uh, I'm looking down at my feet because I'm, I'm trying to put the, uh, the notch of the arrow onto the string and, and load the thing. And as I'm doing that, bright sunny day in May, not a cloud in the sky, I saw this perfectly round circle come over my head and across my shoes. And of course, I looked up and over my head, 30, 40 feet, I don't know, I was eight, I'm not a good judge of uh, right. distance to this mm -hmm. day, uh, was this silver disc. And it was right directly over my head. And it was looked like maybe highly polished aluminum. And was it, it wobbled. Big? It was about maybe 20 feet in diameter. Okay. And I, you know, I was eight at the time and I looked up at that and I thought, wow, I thought, this is cool. I mean, the thing was just, it was just a really incredible experience. I mean, the word sexy really wasn't in my vocabulary <laughs> right. at eight, but, but I said, you know, this is bitching, you know? <laughs> so, so, uh, if you don't mind me asking around how, um, what year was that? When you were sure, eight. 1963. I was eight years old, born in 55, 63. <clears throat> right. So it couldn't have been a drone. It couldn't have been, you know, any other like U.S. technology that was there wasn't it wasn't really around at that time. Well, you know, there was another odd thing happened. And that is as soon as I laid eyes on this thing, I'm in a backyard. It's a beautiful day. There are, you know, people are hanging out laundry, cutting grass. There's cars, there's trucks, just normal sounds of the city. And as soon as I laid eyes on this thing, everything went muffled. I mean, it felt it, everything sounded like I was, you know, had my hands pressed against my ears and it was odd. And I don't know what was up with that, but. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. So I, I watched this thing for a little while and uh, saw it like list to starboard and shoot off from zero to 500 miles an hour. And I'm screaming, mom, you know, <laughs> yeah, and my mother was running on. Yeah, she's thinking I shot a neighbor in the head with an arrow probably or something. Oh, my goodness. I told her, I said, Mom, did you see it? It was cool. Did you see the flying saucer? Uh, UFO wasn't even a term then. And she says, no, Terry, I don't know what you saw, but you did not see a flying saucer. And, you know, that made me a little irritated. I mean, I was a pretty straight kid. I didn't, yeah. I didn't lie. I didn't tell stories. Um, but uh, there, there, there was a backlash from that. You know, my, my dad came home, you know, and said, came home from work and said, what's this business about flying saucers? And I corrected him and said, no, it's singular, just just one. And, you know, correcting his grammar. Always right. off, he said, Terry, you can't tell people you saw that. If you do, they'll think there's something wrong with you. Right. They'll think there's something wrong with us. Yeah, especially at that time, for sure. Yeah, different time. Yeah. yeah. So, at, so after that, okay, th so that happened. Did you kind of forget about it after a while or maybe say maybe it was my imagination or you were very matter of fact on what you saw did it kind of did it stick with you for years after that oh absolutely i it's still fresh in my mind's eye mm -hmm. uh and and there's no doubt about what i saw you know I, sure. I didn't see a weather balloon i didn't see 
I saw something uh, that looked like polished aluminum on the underside, no seams, no rivets, no visible means of propulsion. Um, I felt, no I lights. felt, no lights. No lights. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I felt really disappointed. I couldn't see the top of it. And, uh, right. Cause it, it was like, it was right above you. So it was just the bottom. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So it, it was fun. It was cool. I, I really, really enjoyed it. I got a lot out of it. Um, uh, I never felt an ounce of fear. I kind of felt, um, like it was a compliment for them to show up to see, I felt like they came to see me, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Out of all people, it was just you by yourself in the backyard. Interesting. So, okay. So after that, years go by, you think about it all the time. Then you join the Air Force. Is that the I next did. time? I joined the Air Force right out of school, right mm -hmm. out of high school. Uh, and I trained to become a medic and an EMT, and that's what I did. I drove an ambulance, worked in an emergency room uh, at Whiteman Air Force Base in Western Missouri. It was a SAC base, a nuclear base then, and, and still is. It's a home of the B-2 bombers. And um, so that, that's where, I, and I spent all six years of my enlistment there. So I like my job, I like the people, and... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we had this experience in June 1977. I worked with this guy named Toby, and Toby and I were best of friends. We were both newly married. Our wives were friends. And uh, he came to me one night in the middle of the, you know, we worked 11 p.m. to 8 a.m. in the middle of the night and said, hey, man, I got an idea. Let's go camping. And I'm like, camping? Are you nuts? You know, what? what why would we want to go camping? Because, I mean, I was a city kid. I knew I'd never been camping. Yeah, he was sure. in Flint, Michigan. I really suspected he'd never been camping. And uh, I, I, I didn't understand. But it, the weird thing was, the idea really grew on me. And it was a six-hour drive away down south, just across the Arkansas border. And uh, so we made that trip. And it was... Uh, it was it was amazing. We we had a um, an agreement that we weren't going to stay in a campground because my my I was there because I was into photography. I wanted to take pictures of maybe some wildlife. My friend Toby is there because he's an amateur astronomer. Uh, you know he's he's like Neil. You know he wanted to be. Uh, matter of fact, he wanted to go to University of Michigan uh, and get a degree in physics and then you know, try to do something at the, at the uh, postgraduate level. Mm -hmm. um, so he wanted to be someplace where he could look at the sky with the light pollution. And we couldn't do that in the campground. So we drove down, we pulled into the park, we dodged the ranger station. Uh, we took a back road, really had no idea where we were going, except we were going to just pick out our own campsite. And we came to this a uh, chain across the fence, a chain across the, the road uh, with a big sign, do not keep out, no honey, no fishing, no nothing. And Is this I thought- like in the middle of that. nowhere, kind of? Oh, absolutely in the middle of the nowhere. Okay. It's still in the middle of nowhere, but I got to tell you in 77, there was nothing. Nothing, there. right. Very little there. Uh, it was all it was all just forest. Uh, Devil's Den State Park takes up a huge chunk of space. And then on the east side, there is the Ozark National Forest, which is huge. Uh, so there's just nothing out there. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it at the time, but that that gate that we got around, maneuvered around and got into the what we thought was the park, it's actually um, a boundary line. Uh, that The land that we entered is owned by the Bureau of Land Management. And uh, it's interesting. We, we drove around and we came upon this plateau and it's uh, it was just beautiful. It just stuck out. And we, we drove up this plateau, my old Impala, and crested the top of it. And the place was just gorgeous. And we were on a flat surface at the top, mm -hmm. uh, no trees, just grass. And uh, we were high enough, we were level. The top of the plateau was level with the surrounding forest. So the view was absolutely amazing. 
and we, uh, you know, we set up camp. We did all the fun stuff you do when you go camping. And we um, got a bonfire going, uh, kind of a bonfire that evening. You know, we set up the tent, you know, cook hot dogs, did all that stuff. At around 9 o'clock p.m., we're, we're kicked back on these uh, Walmart air mattresses. And we had the fire in between us. And Toby and I are just just talking. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember I said, you know, man, I, I can understand why people enjoy this. You know, this, this is pleasant. Uh, it was June. It was a little on the hot side. We had a nice breeze going. And I, I noticed that because, I, you know, I'm not a woodsman. I, I've never been camping before. But right. there's stuff in the forest that <laughs> makes noise at night. You know, crickets, tree frogs, whatever they are. And they were so loud that we had to raise our voice to be heard by one another talking across the fire. And a few minutes later, that died. The sound, the whole forest went silent. Wow. Even the breeze that we had stopped and things went still. And that kind of unnerved me. And I'm like, Toby, man, is this, is this normal? You know, like he's going to have a clue. And <laughs> He says, look, you know, we've been laughing and cutting up. We just quieted them. You know, don't worry about the bugs and the tree frogs. They'll come back. They'll be back. Don't worry about that. I'm like, okay. Um, so I didn't, and we're kind of carrying on, but I'm still unnerved by this. And a few minutes later, I know my friend has his head turned to the west looking at something. And I'm like, I'm about to ask him, hey, what are you looking at? And he asked me, hey, Terry, were those lights there before? And I'm like, what lights? There are no lights. There's there's nothing around here. You know, I mean, we're in the middle of nowhere. What lights? Uh, and I couldn't see because his torso was in the way. So I had to stand up and I saw what he was looking at. On the horizon, on the west horizon, there was a cluster of three little stars in a perfect triangle. And they sat above the horizon. You know, they're too far off the horizon to have been lights from a, a train or a right. parking lot. or uh, They just didn't belong there. And uh, we, we uh, kind of like, you know, well, what, what is this thing? What, what, what are we looking at? And I said, Toby, you're the space guy. What is that thing? Is that like a star system we're looking at or something? Because there were a trillion stars out that night. Yeah. And he says, no, no, no. He says that, I don't know what that is, but that's, those aren't stars. I mean, Were you nervous like after stars. he said that? Did you start to get really nervous? Yeah, I did start to get really nervous. And while we're kind of debating what this thing is, um, it moved. And what it did was it rotated about 120 degrees and aligned the base of the triangle parallel with the, with the horizon, you know, with the apex, the point headed up. And we're watching this and then it starts to climb upward. It starts to go and we could see three points of light. What's interesting is both of us um, felt this sense of calm. Our, our emotions were muted. You know, we're just a, a few seconds earlier, we're like, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Man, what is it? You know, we, we should have been excited. Right. And then suddenly we weren't. Um, and, but I felt almost semi sedated. I had no anxiety. Um, and this sounds weird, but I don't know how else to put it. I felt more like, an observer than a participant in what was going on. And, and that was strange. Um, so we watched this thing, it climbed up into the sky as far as it could go. And uh, it rotated or it changed uh, position. It went from, we went from seeing three stars and it did one of these with the point of the triangle, there were lights at the yeah. points, three points in the triangle, mm -hmm. and was pointed at us. And it starts this, I don't know how high it was, maybe 10, 12,000 feet, I'm guessing. Uh, at the time, I didn't know how big it was. Uh, and it starts this like glide plane down toward us, no noise, no sound, um, still just in a really odd place. Uh, and I don't know, you know, I talked to lots of people um, since 2018. And that seems to be more common than you'd think. And I think it speaks to the level of influence that these things can have over us. I was gonna I was actually gonna ask you that I didn't want to cut you off because I'm like intrigued by the story. But um, do you do you now have a, a community 
that you could relate to, like people that you could talk to and have a, uh, cause I, I feel like I've, uh, I've watched all the documentaries, I've watched the podcast and stuff. And it seems like most people have the, the same story. Um, it's, it, you know, it makes you seem, feel like there, it couldn't be a conspiracy at this point. Everyone that that I've seen always says they have a, a sense of calmness that, you know, um, the aliens or the UFOs kind of always say, like, we're not going to hurt you. We just want we want you to we want to have world peace, um, protect the planet. Um, you know, we have no, we don't have a history of violence. Um, was there anything like that? Did they I, I'll let you finish. I'm just gonna let you finish. Just so, so the the, the UFOs are coming towards you, right? And uh, we're watching it glide in, mm -hmm. and it gets low, close to the ground, and we could see it dimmed the lights that were on the points of the triangle, but it lit up the forest, and it just cruised in and uh, stopped about three thousand feet over our heads, um, and it was absolutely silent and it was enormous i mean we're talking it was the size of a walmart or a medical building oh my it goodness. was enormous wow and i don't understand how this thing wasn't seen in you know three ter or three uh counties but it wasn't and uh but when you saw from far away it just looked like three lights but when it got yes. closer it was all solid it wasn't anything separate yeah, it, the three lights, there was a point on the apex of, of you know, each point of the triangle had right. a light on it. And uh, what we couldn't see was that the thing was actually kind of deep. Um, it, it was very big. And, you know, I didn't feel scared. I didn't feel intimidated. I felt, uh, I just felt like, well, this is neat, you know. And uh, while we're watching it, from underneath this thing and in the center, uh it shot out a ray of light uh and it was a milky white light you know the effect you get if you're um uh, on on the coast and there's thick fog and you see a searchlight you see that column yeah white light cut yep. through the fog yep that's what this was like but of course there was no fog mm -hmm. there was just this visible weird white light and it boom came on like somebody flipped, flipped the switch and it landed right in the middle of our campfire and was there. I looked at Toby, he looked at me, we looked at the thing, nobody said a word. And it was only there for maybe a minute. And then it clicked off. And immediately afterward, um, a laser beam about the diameter of a pencil, kind of a bluish purple. And I'd only seen lasers on TV. This was 1977, they yeah, were relatively new. Sure. Mm -hmm. And this laser, came down and landed on all the stuff that we brought and us it what it would do is it like land on my chest for a millisecond and then appear on the tent and then on the cooler and it gave the impression this thing is just dancing around but i noticed that you know it hit me in the chest at least four times i didn't feel a thing i know it hit toby i know it hit the tent it hit the um, backpack toby's cooler uh, my car, all the stuff that was uh, foreign, you know, to the top of that plateau, uh, it hit. And I'm thinking, you know, this thing's checking us out. Uh, and that lasted uh, maybe two minutes, a couple minutes. And then that turned off. And then, you know, I said that we were in this like semi sedated mode. That transition from being uh, sedated to sleepy and they're, they're two completely different things. And all of a sudden, all I wanted to do was pick up my air mattress, go in the tent and go to sleep. That's all I wanted to do. And they're still there. And it's still right over our heads by 3000 feet. Okay. Toby's ahead of me. He's already thrown his mattress in the, in the little Kmart tent we bought. And, uh, you know, he gets on top of it. He's asleep in a heartbeat. And, you know, I didn't undress, which will come in interesting <laughs> later. I, I was wearing a t-shirt, uh, jeans, my combat boots. And uh, 
So I threw my air mattress in, I fell on top of that, and I was asleep like that. And uh, the next thing I remember was these orange and white lights flashing through the canvas of the tent, and it woke me up. And the tent was absolutely, it was absolutely dark in there. You couldn't see a thing, couldn't see your hand in front of your face until these lights flashed. And then, you know, the inside of the tent lit up like a ballpark at night. And uh, I'm thinking, you know, where am I at? Oh yeah, I'm camping, I'm here with Toby, uh, these lights. I'm running through my mind, what could this possibly be? And I'm thinking, you know, this is probably like those uh, lights on top of a park ranger's truck you know, yellow lights. To so you, you, you kind of just forgot that it was out there. I mean, you just, they, it made you so tired that you had to lay down and then you're like, did you, did you forget? I absolutely had no, it didn't cross my mind at all. It's not like wow. I forgot, it did not cross <laughs> my mind. And there were kind of a lot of things going on real quickly. I sat up and I noticed that my shoes were unlaced. And it didn't scare me, but it concerned me because I knew I knew that I didn't go to bed with them like that. I mean, the military teaches you to take care of your feet, and I would have laced them up, which that's how they were. They were laced to the top when I went to sleep. Or I'd have taken them off, but I wouldn't have done that. You know, if you had to run, it'd be a trip hazard. So, right. you know. Uh, but that annoyed me. I took off my boots, and then I noticed my socks are on sideways. And I'm really like, well, that's not right. That's not right. And it you know, never, never crossed my mind that we'd been dressed and undressed, redressed by someone. Right. And uh, I turn, I put on my boots properly. Uh, lights still flashing. I turn my attention to Toby, and uh, I'm. He's looking. He's on his knees too. He's looking out his little panel on the side of his tent, and I'm like, Toby, man, what is it? What's out there? Is it park rangers? What? Who's here? What's going on? And. Uh, he didn't answer me or gave me a no nonsense answer. And in the flash of one of these lights, I could see, I guess that the saline in our tears fluoresces with, with bright white light. And when the lights would flash, I could see a tear track down the right side of his eye. And now that scared me. That's the first time I felt fear because I couldn't imagine what would make this guy cry. Right. That's just, um, so I, I look out and I, my flap of the tent, and I noticed two things. And that is that this triangle that was three feet over our heads when we went to bed had descended, and it's now 30 feet over our heads. Well, it was 3,000 feet, and now it's 30. 3,000 feet, now it's 30. Mm -hmm. Thank God we had camped on the edge of the plateau. Uh, actually, I wanted to camp in the middle, and Toby said, no, no, let's camp over here. Thank God we did, because otherwise this thing would have been on top of us. As it was, we were kind of offset from it. Um, yeah, and uh, the second thing I noticed was all around the plateau, and these, I can't see them until there are flashes of light, I see these little gray guys. I mean, classic little gray guys. And they didn't have the huge uh, motion picture-like black eyes, you know, they had, uh, their eyes were black, but only about the size, like a, like a pair of wraparound Ray-Bans. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they're walking around, they're all absolutely identical. Uh, and I, I can't tell if they're wearing a garment or if that's their, their body or what, but they're gray. And I, after this, I have uh, an opinion about that. And a lot of people agree with me, and that is that I don't think those are living sentient beings. You know, they're not sentient like you and I are. They're mm. not self-aware, right? I think yeah, they're, they're like help the helpers, like yeah, genetically we're, modified. We're yeah, absolutely. They came off an assembly line, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like robots, kind of. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's not the first time I heard that. Actually, what did the texture of their skin or suit look like? Like, was it shiny? Was it matte? It was matte gray, mm -hmm. uh, and at first glance, it looks like a garment, but I'm not sure, uh, because if it was a garment, it was very tight fitting. Um, I, I couldn't see, at this point, I couldn't see them. I, I'd get to see them up close a little later, but at this point, I couldn't really see them well. Um, 
And we are absolutely, you know, my fear level's at a 10. I mean, I'm just absolutely Yeah, like out. my heart is beating right now just listening to the story. I cannot, oh. I couldn't imagine seeing that in person. Oh, it was, it was, it was terrible. I mean, and I was afraid that I was going to cough or Toby would sneeze or something and draw their attention and they'd come in our direction. You know, we, we didn't know they were long done with us. So, right. We had no idea what time it was. We both, um, as EMTs, we had to wear good watches. It would, you know, integral to the job. Mm -hmm. And uh, both of our watches stopped. Mine stopped at 2.30, Toby stopped at like 2.33. And those watches never worked again. They were mechanical wind up watches that I found out later are very sensitive to magnetic fields. And, the, it was an Elgin watch. I took out the little, it was a gift. And, and I went home and I had the uh, instruction booklet and I'm looking through it, just kind of curious. And it says, you know, don't expose to magnetic fields. So crazy. So, yeah, so I think that that uh, something was going on. So we had no, th- no idea what time it was. We, it turned out we were about an hour away from sunrise. And um the next thing that happened was right from the center of the uh, triangle, there came another light and it was a cylinder of white light about 30 feet in diameter. I say that because it was just about as wide as this thing was tall off the ground. Okay. And uh, as soon as that turned on, these little guys all stopped and it drew their attention and they weren't in a hurry, but they all started kind of just ambling towards this this white light. And I didn't count them, I wish I had 12, maybe 15 uh, of them were there and they were paired up in like twos and threes. And I saw, we watched, the first two of them stepped into this, they formed like a cue, like a line. And the first two of them stepped in and they pixelated out, just like, just like the Star Trek thing. They just pixelated out and were gone. And we watched until the last three guys were were gone. And then uh, we saw this thing take off and it didn't take off like a rocket ship. It just lifted up like a hot air balloon and the higher it went, the faster it went. And it made a little bit of a turn and went up. We saw three lights in the sky and then one light and then gone. Wow. And Toby's like, let's get out of here. Like, right, yeah. Uh-uh. <laughs> I ain't leaving this tent until it's daylight. You know? Right. <laughs> you know. Oh my uh, goodness. I I saw the documentary of the the kids in Zimbabwe. Did you watch that one? Yes, the school the, the school, school story. in Zimbabwe. And they also said that they were pixelated. Yes, they said that's that. right. That's right. They did say that. So interesting. Well, you know what? I never talked about this topic. Um to anyone other than my wife, uh, I you know I made my living in the law, as you know, and you know as a civil servant. Well, first you know if you're in the Air Force and you say, "Hey, I saw a UFO," they're going to send you out for a psych eval and probably kick you out of the military. Yeah, I'm sure. Definitely yeah. at that time. I mean, they're coming forward now. Uh, a lot of a lot of people in the Air Force are coming forward now. Oh, well, they sure are. Yeah. They sure are. <clears throat> so. Um. So go ahead, finish. Go ahead. No, I, that, that's all I had to say. That's all um, I had. So do you remember anything about the abduction? A little. Yes, I do. Um, Tell me. Some of it returned it. in, you know, nightmares. Uh, some of it returned in what I called uh, intrusive thoughts, but I was told that there are... Um, they're actually flashbacks from PTSD. Um, right. And 2018, I decided uh, that I was going to go public with this. I knew nobody in the UFO community. I thought I was the only one in the world that had this experience. And um, I had no idea how common it is. You know, I put a little, uh, I put my email address in the back of my book, Terry Lovelace at yahoo.com. And I say, you know, look, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a therapist, uh, I'm not a scientist, I'm just a guy, 
But if you've had an experience, uh, you know, with a UFO, with an alien, Bigfoot, ghost, I don't care. You've had something, uh, I don't like the word paranormal. I say ontological, something, you know, something out there. Yeah. Write to me. I'd love to hear from you. And as of this morning, since March of 2018, um, I have over 4,000, over 4,400 wow. emails from people. Um, so I, I'll tell you, I wrote this book uh, for myself, really. I wrote it as a catalyst to get this thing out of my system. And I fully expected I'd put it up on Amazon. I'd sell 100 copies and maybe have a box of 50 in my garage or something. And then, then I could gain some kind of peace over this thing. Um, and to my surprise, it was, uh, it really resonated with a lot of people. And I've sold like 30,000 books in 11 countries. Wow. Congratulations. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Out of the 4,000 uh, people that emailed you, um, did, did you resonate with any of their stories? Did anything sound familiar? Boy, it sure did. Um, I'll tell you what I did. I, I'm kind of a data guy. So I made a spreadsheet, of course. Mm -hmm. And I looked for all these commonalities, you know, right, like, right. The, you know, the noise, uh, you know, distortion in audio, um, that feeling of calm. Um, another big one was there was a change in Toby and, and there was a change in our relationship. We went from being friends and I don't know why, but I got in the car to come home and we were both burned terribly. We had like the worst sunburn I ever had in my life. I mean, everywhere on my body. And we were, um, we had what they call flash burns to our eyes. So real photophobic. It's what a welder would get if they didn't wear that. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you think that that's was. from them? Yeah, Definitely that's from, from them. them. Okay, go ahead. So uh, I noticed that uh, I suddenly wanted nothing to do with this guy. I, I, I mean, and that's not, that's not me. I mean, if I'm your friend, I'm your friend. And uh, that's very common. Really? Very common. Yes. I had all oh, kinds of letters. I had, uh, you know, I, I wrote a second book called Devil's Den, The Reckoning. <clears throat> and I put a whole bunch of the stories that people sent me with their permission uh, in this in this book. And uh, there's just all kinds of stuff in common. A lot of stuff. Why do you uh, think that is? Do you think it's because the... The aliens don't want you guys to converse about what happened, relive it, uh, come up with a, I don't know, a plan to like, you know, to tell people, do interviews together. Maybe it's easier for, you know, when it's one person, you could say, okay, he's lying, for example, versus two people that it happened at the same time, then there's more credibility. Do why, why do you think it's their main objective to like not have people, you know, talk about them? That's I feel like it's like that. It's like they want to keep this this secret. Absolutely. They want to keep it. And I think you're spot on, you know, I mean, you know, from an evidentiary standpoint, two witnesses are better than one. Right. And especially if their stories are together. Um, I think, that's yeah, and they, the you know, let's say they separate you guys. You guys have the same stories, then it's like, oh shit, you know, this is like, yeah. this is huge. So they they mentally make you like not want to have anything to do with that person. That's so interesting. And you said other people had the the same stories. Yeah, they sure did. Um, wow, lots of stories. Um, like I, the a couple that stand out was this group of uh, family, mom, dad, uncle, uh, a couple of kids are on vacation. They come out of a motel um, to walk to their car early in the morning. And here's this silver cigar shaped thing right over their head, right over their heads. And they look up and they're like, wow, well, that's cool. You know, everybody's got a camera. Nobody thinks to take a picture. That's another common alley. That's another very common thing sure. that happens. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're shocked. You're not like, oh my God, let me hurry up. Like, you're just taking it all in. Like, I can't believe this is happening to me. Yeah. You know, on our trip, Toby had a camera within within reach. Right. 
and the thought of taking a picture never crossed his mind. I think that that again speaks to this level of control that they have. Um, well, we'll say influence, control. Yeah. Do Do uh, you uh, think? Did you see any other type of aliens besides the Greys? I did. I did. Um, I re I have some memories of being inside this thing. And I don't know how they took us, and I don't know how they got us in there. Uh, it was suddenly I wake up, I'm semi alert, and I'm holding my boots and all of my clothing in my hands like this. And I can't move. Um, there's, there's a famous guy, Calvin Parker, a uh, good guy from Louisiana, had a incredible experience back in the early seventies. And, uh, he had the same thing. He could move, he could move his eyes, but like me, he, I was, I was frozen. I couldn't move an inch, uh, but I could roll my eyes and look around. So my friend Tobias there. And the first thing I noticed is that, uh, the place that we're in looks much bigger than what we saw from the outside. Now, I don't know, maybe they took us someplace else. I don't know if their physics are right. different than ours or what. But while this thing was the size of a Walmart, from our perspective outside of it, once inside of it, I mean, it's as big as an NFL stadium. Wow. And that's, that's been reported too. That's not unusual um, as you think. So, uh, but the, the, the family that... Um, Saw the silver cigar shaped thing, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you said you seen the other alien. What, what did that alien look like? Yeah, well, here, here understand. I've I've never had a clear linear memory of everything that happened. All I have is bits and pieces. Gotcha. Um, a lot of it that came through in in nightmares. Um, but I mean, even the, even during the the, the nightmares, or um, did you? Do you remember them maybe saying something to you or did they, were they like blue or white or, or you don't, you don't have a recollection of that? I do have a recollection of that. Um, there were, we were in this enormous place um, and there were like catwalks that went up many, many stories. It was just gigantic. Um, and there were like big garage doors to my left and your little you know, saucer like things on tripods sitting there. And it was just uh, crazy. And I'm watching these little gray guys and, you know, they're running all over the place. And, uh, you know, I think I used the word worker bee in the uh, book. Um, but yeah, you know, they they were all task oriented. Nobody was taking a smoke break. Everybody was, uh, they were all doing something. Did they look different? The other ones? No, but I got a better look at them. Um, and, and there's not much more to add than what I already said. You know, their eyes about the size of ray bands. They were gray in complexion, um, two nose, you know, nostrils, no, no cartilage in a nose, mm -hmm. no cartilage for ears, just a hole. Well, that's um, what I mean. There was only grays. There weren't any other type of aliens there. Oh, no, there were others. Uh, I'm going to tell you about that right now. All right. Uh, I'm listening. I'm excited. <laughs> from my field of view from my right i saw a guy walk and he's wearing some kind of uniform that's like gray knit but he's this definitely is a garment this guy is six foot tall so he stands out against the rest of these guys you know no hair um and his complexion is pink um, well, okay, okay, hold on. What kind of pink? You know, um, is it like a baby pink? Is it like a Barbie pink? Is it a neon pink? Is it a magenta? It's not. A, it's not a bright, deep pink. It's more of a pink tint to his skin. Okay, like a pale. But if you look at him, you definitely think, "Oh, that guy's pink." You <laughs> know. That's so cool. And and what, did, what were his features like? What's that? His features, were they like the grays? Did, did they have yes. the same features? Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. he had, um, 
the eyes were the same, the nostrils were the same, same slit for a mouth, and um, you know the ears were the same. And uh, you know, I thought about like? that over the years, and you know, it's like uh, if you're going to make something, you know, make it um, to look like yourself. I mean, maybe I don't know. So you think know. we're in an alien simulation? I didn't say that, although I wouldn't rule that out. Same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, Elon Musk is pretty uh, convinced that we're in a simulation. Me too. I truly believe uh, that. Yeah. I. Uh, anyway, back back to Pinky. Okay. Uh, back to Pinky. Yeah. He's walking <laughs> across my field of vision at about 10 feet, 15 feet. Yeah, probably more 15 feet away. And I'm watching him and he carries himself like someone in authority. You know, you know how they are. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah of course. And, and I could, I immediately thought this guy is uh, an officer or a crew member that has some kind of, of ranking. And uh, I watch him. He didn't look at us. He walked past us and um, he's just barely visible to my left. And he was doing something on a panel, pushing buttons or something. And I had my eyes turned as far to the left as I can get them. And in an instant, what happened was just by, I think just by happenstance, he turned and we locked eyes. And of all the things that happened that night, I think this was the most scary. And that was the second we locked eyes, this guy was in my head. And I don't know any other way to say it. Um, I felt like he downloaded everything that I know, uh, every experience I've ever had. He oh knew God. me, he knew my wife, he knew my hobbies, he knew my secrets, he knew everything about me. And uh, I didn't know anything about him, except that um, this guy just radiated intellect. I mean, you know what's like, I, we used to have a dog, uh, Astro, you know, come and put her head in my lap and I'd pet her. And, uh, you know, she looked up at me with the big brown eyes and, um, but we each knew our respective roles, right? you know, and she could understand, you know, walk and food and, you know, a handful of commands. Um, but, you know, I think we both understood I was, you know, the, the master and she was the pet. Yeah. And. In this equation with Pinky, I felt like I was the dog. I felt absolutely inadequate, uh, intellectually, emotionally. Everybody well, like Neil, you watched the interview with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yes. You know, he said that a higher being could look at us as chimpanzees. That we like, we can't even communicate. Yes, I saw that. I saw that. <laughs> I would, I would, I'd love to talk to Neil deGrasse Tyson sometime. I've watched a bunch of his uh, interviews, you know, Joe Rogan. And, oh, yes, yeah, uh, same, same. Love him, it, obsessed with him. Uh, you know what, he, I, I've i always liked, I think the guy's an American hero. I really do. Um, I agree. But I think all the kids out there that, you know, mom, can I have a telescope? You know, and he just got all these kids on fire and curious about the sky. Yeah. And, you know, and I, and I agree also with something else that he said, and that's kind of like, uh, time is precious. And he was talking about, um, you know, while other guys might be talking about sports, um, he didn't do that. Uh, he was thinking about other stuff. Yep. He was thinking about, you know, and I was the same way. I haven't. I mean, the only football game I've ever been to in my life was when my son was at Michigan State. I went and watched Michigan State play in a game. The tailgating was fun. You know, I, the, the rest was, eh, it was okay. It was fun. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not a sports guy. And, um, you know, that really resonated with me. Uh, I'm, uh, I get all my medical care from the VA. And uh, I go down there and there's always a bunch of guys. And, we're, you know, we all have something in common. We're all prior military, and we, we're all sitting around and talking. And every time there's a conversation, 
the conversation always relates to the football game, the baseball game, something. Right. Everything is sports centric. And I'm not saying the sports are bad. Sports are great. They're good. Um, I worry sometimes that kids maybe think got their eye on playing for the NFL or playing professional sports. And, um, and that's a fine dream to have, but you know, the odds of doing that are, are, are pretty slim. They are. So they are. Yeah. Don't, you don't have to dismiss he definitely that. Definitely, He made being an astrophysicist very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. So let, let, so let's go back. Cause we love Neil. Shout out to Neil to grass Tyson. We love you now. Um, so Pinky, guess we're going to call him Pinky. Yes. He's in your head. He downloads everything. You can't explain it, but it's like you just know that he he saw you as uh, it was just a higher intelligence, let's just yes. say. Yes. And so Pinky was there. Who else was there? There was another set of beings. Um, they came and they, they took us and I had my clothes in my hand still. My feet are on this, this gray rubberized uh, flooring. I can still move my eyes, but I can't move my body. And little guy, gray guys come and got us. And um, well, they took Toby first. And I heard Toby screaming, no, no, no. Uh, and that scared me because I knew it'd be my turn next. Right. And we heard a woman screaming. Um, so they got, they took me by the by the arms, and it was like it was like I was on a cushion of air. Uh, I couldn't feel the floor on my feet anymore, uh, and they just walked me like I like they were carrying a mannequin, and we went down this long corridor. And these are the grays, still. These are the grays. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, to my on my left is a wall, just a white wall. On my right. There's a series of uh, glass tanks like aquariums and they vary in size from, you know, a foot square all the way up to big enough for a human being. And they were all empty uh, except for one. And one had this like pink water in it. And there was what I thought was a puppy. It looked like a puppy, you know, newborn, newborn puppies have that eyes closed and, you know, the kind of, uh, yeah, that's what it looked like. Uh, brown in color. And as I'm walking past it, it opened the eye, it opened its eyes. And I just, of course, I could do nothing about it, but I about right. flipped out. I mean, and they took me to this, at the end of the hallway, there was this room and it was a dome shaped white room everything was either white the floor was gray or stainless steel those were the three uh, you know decor that they had is and i got the best way i can t i got a real medical vibe from this experience and it was and like a medical examination and little gray guys took my clothing from me and they somehow levitated me or turned me sideways and slid me onto this table. And I thought, oh, that's nice. It's warm. They warmed it up for me. Well, no, they didn't. It, it, it's warm because there's been a parade of people there before me. Oh, my goodness. And there were two beings. Uh, I don't know. You've probably heard the, the phrase uh, mantis creatures. I have not. No. These things were seven foot tall and they look like a praying mantis. I know that's way out there, but that's what I, I saw. I believe you, man. I'm the, okay, so go ahead. And you know, in my mind's eye, I always see them in white lab coats. I don't think they were wearing white lab coats. I think that may have been a projection, uh, you know, for my benefit to let me know that this isn't going to be a torture session. This is going to be something medical and uh they did some stuff to my lower back and 
and it hurt a lot. And, I, and I'm thinking, you know, if these guys are so smart, why, you know, why, why can't they give me some, you know, yeah, purple, sedative, something, uh, yeah. First said, yeah, you know, do something. Yeah. Uh, I can't scream because I can't open my mouth. So I'm just making as much noise as I can trying to get this thing's attention. Um, and I think I annoyed it. And people say, oh, no, that couldn't have happened. They don't have emotions. Well, I'm telling you, I pissed this guy off. <laughs> you know, the, this, this mantis thing. Yeah, I'm sure they have and emotions. I'm sure they do. So, okay, and so paint, paint the picture for me. Uh, mantis, obviously green. Yes. Same color as a prey mantis. Just like the bug in your garden. Yes. Did they, was, was their body shaped like a prey mantis? It was only, I saw two sets of limbs on the upper body. Um, and then I guess they had, they, they had legs, but from my vantage point, I could only see right. them from about the waist up. Right. Um, but yeah, that's what they look like. And their, but their arms, were they like, did they have hands? No, they had, um, Pinchers, like, a green, like a green, like a green, well, I guess you could call it a hand, like a green uh, appendage that stuck out. Mm -hmm. And then there were little appendages that went out from there. Um, but they could manipulate those. Right. And they could manipulate, you know, these stainless steel instruments, like, you know, very well. Wow. So, um, but as I said, I, I annoyed this guy and telepathically, he spoke to me and in my head with crystal clarity, I heard, why are you screaming? Stop screaming. You know, we don't hurt you. You know, we take you back now. Stop screaming. And he tapped me on my forehead with just green finger. And I was out. I was just unconscious. And the next memory that I have was waking up by the car out in the field. And matter of fact, I remember I woke up and I'm still just barely conscious. And I'm thinking, oh, these guys screwed up. They could have at least put us back in the tent. I swear, I no sooner thought that than there were like six of these little guys around us. And they dragged us both back and threw us both in the tent. Wow. I must have gone back to sleep. Um, so when you woke up, how was your back feeling? Did you still have pain after or it was just during that moment? I've had pain in my back since June of 1977. And it's, it's still there, you know, now, you know, I'm at the age where I have some arthritic changes. Um, but yeah, my back is hurt. So um, after that is when you start having back problems. It's when I started what? I'm sorry. After, after that, you started having back problems after that. I did. Gotcha. I, did. Wow. I mean, you know, it really didn't affect my life. It was just more of an inconvenience. Um, I get it, but it's still like I have back problems because I was abducted by aliens and, you know, they were like fucking around with my back and it was painful. Like, you know, how do you explain that to someone that's not open minded? You, you can't. Right, right, right. Can't. You know, I, I, I'm glad you, you let me just address that real quick. Talking about raising this topic with with people that. um don't believe that this is real. And I think that if you don't have the experience, you have no, no basis of fact. I mean, you know, I understand. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson is a scientist and for him, he wants empirical proof. And uh, empirical proof about this topic is very hard to get. Right. And, uh, you know, there was, I, in college, I read Plato's Republic, and there's this uh, allegory in there about these people that live in this cave, and they've been they were born there, they grew up in this cave. It's not a real story; it's a, you know, it's it's a thought exercise. And there's four of them chained to a wall, and all they can see is the wall across from them. And uh, there are these uh, beings that. Uh, would take, uh, well, you know, they'd make shadows on the wall, say that they'd make shadows on the wall. So these four 
people thought that that was the real world and that's all there was to it. Right. Well, one of these guys manages to escape. He gets out and finds the world and sunshine that he's never seen before and trees. And he's blown away and he's like, oh my God, there's a whole different world here. I got to tell the guys. So he goes back to the cave and he says, hey, guess what, guys? None of this, none of this, re this is real. You know, this shit ain't real. But I've, I've seen what's real and you, you got to see it. It's incredible. And they were like, yeah, you know, they didn't believe the guy. Right. Not only did they not believe him, they were hostile towards him. And that's because, you know, you mess with somebody's paradigm with how, how they see the world. And um, not everyone is open minded. Uh, a lot of people think absolutely. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Dunning Kruger effect. No, tell me. It's uh, well, it, it's how if you if you Google it, in a nutshell, what it is is these two psychologists uh, interviewed a bunch of people and they made this. Uh, they did this uh, study. And what it is, is they took people and ask, you know, how well do you drive? You know, middle aged people, how well do you drive? And um, people said, Oh, I'm, you know, some guy, some people said, I'm an excellent driver, I, I drive with care. I, I, and those people, you know, had a string of tickets behind them. And the people that said the people that questioned their ability, and said, you know, I think I'm a good driver, I, I do as well as I can. Um, they're the better one, better drivers. Yeah, they're yeah, they're more truthful. So right. you know, they don't want anybody to mess with their with their self image of uh, their perception of how they drive, or how they shoot basketball, or how they do anything. Um, so yeah, I, I think pe people are, there. There's an element of hostility that that goes. I'll, with I'll this. never understand that. I'll never, huh. I mean, well, I, I think the level of hostility, um, people have to then question their religions, how they grew up, what they were taught, the beginning of life, you know, and I think that's when they, you telling your story makes them feel attacked, which is unfair, right? Yeah. Because uh, this is your story. You know what I mean? Like everyone is, everyone is different. Everyone believes in different things, but, uh, I love being open-minded and, and, and hearing things like this because I truly believe it. I believe you, I believe everything you've experienced. Um, and, uh, I'm, well, thank uh, you for that. yeah, absolutely. thank you for that. And, and I would like to add that I'm, Please don't think I don't want the, your audience to think I'm here to change anybody's mind. That is not the purpose of this exercise. I'm here to tell you what happened to me. That's all I can do. And I can tell it Absolutely. honestly, candidly, to the best of my ability. And, you know, you can believe it if you want. You can doubt it. You can dismiss it. It's okay. I don't mind. It's okay. Yeah. I was at the UFO Congress in uh, 2019 in Phoenix. And... Uh, I'm at a table and I had a stack of books, my books in front of me. And uh, this guy from the audience uh, walks over and uh, everybody had been very gracious. This guy picks up my book and says, huh? And he throws it down on the table and says, prove it to me. Was I he said, religious? Oh, shit. You know, I, I you know, I want to read the book, read it. You decide. I don't care. I'm not going to change your mind. Yeah. People are so weird. That's so, like people are weird. So weird. It's like I'm that? you're telling your story. You don't have to prove shit at the end of the day. It's like either you want to believe you or not or keep it moving. You yeah, know? keep moving. Yeah, and that's it. Um, OK, so we're on the ship. The praying mantis. Alien is there green. Same features as the pink guy and the grays, correct? Yes. Same type of features. OK. Um and the pink guy was more of like an authoritarian figure. The praying mantis one was more of of like a medical doctor, I guess you would say. Correct. Any Definitely. any uh, any other ones? No. That's Those it. Are the other ones that I saw. Wow. Did you ever have a 
So all the emails or conversations that you had with people, did they see the Mantis ones or the pink ones? I haven't had a single soul tell me they saw a pink one. To my knowledge, I guess I'm the only guy that saw one. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there's probably other people out there. I mean, a sample of 4,400 people isn't really all that much. It's not. No, it's not. But. I mean, I think there's, there's tens of thousands of people all over the world that have had some kind of experience. You know what uh, was kind of humbling is that these people are writing me and they're t saying, I've never shared this story with anyone, not even my wife or my husband uh, or my parents or whatever. Um, so they choose a, tra a stranger and they send me their stories. And, and there's another thread of commonality. And that is the first paragraph is usually a disclaimer saying, Please don't think I'm crazy. I'm not yeah. drinking. I'm not nuts. You know, um, I could imagine you have to. People feel like they have to say that. And then they tell me amazing stories. Wow. Just incredible stories. So interesting. Um, so okay. So where's Toby? Your mind is telling you I don't want to hang out with this guy anymore, right? Do you guys never talk again? Was it just over? I saw after him that? one time. When, when we got back to the base, the Air Force separated us and Toby was cut orders to go to Japan, like at light speed. So why do you think that is? Pardon? Why do you think that is? Did you guys tell your story to them or no? Well, no, we made it. We made a pact that we weren't going to tell the story, although it it turned out that um, there were these guys from the OSI, the Office of Special Investigation. And if anyone's listening has not heard of OSI, OSI is to the Air Force what NCIS is to the Navy. Mm -hmm. So it's the investigative branch of the Air Force's security police. Uh huh. And I was hospitalized for the burns that I had, the burns to my eyes, and they separated us. Uh, as soon as we got to the hospital, they, they said, and matter of fact, the hospital commander who I knew well, the base commander who I'd seen but never had a conversation with, and some guy in civilian clothes came into the exam room when the doctor had finished my examination. And the hospital commander said, and we were on good terms, but he said, Sergeant Lovelace, you're to have no contact with Sergeant Tobias in any way, shape, or form. He says, that means orally, by telephone, in writing, you're not to give him anything. You're not to accept anything from him. If you're at the base exchange and you run into one another, you're immediately to turn around and walk the other direction. So, so yeah. they knew somehow. Oh, I know they knew. I know they knew. They, they came to my hospital. <clears throat> I was in the hospital three days. They came on the third day, and these two OSI agents came in and, you know, put me through this um, very harsh interrogation. And I mean, I'm 22 years old. I don't have the benefit of life experience. I yeah, you're a baby. Autograph. 22 is so young. You know, they're scaring me. They're scaring me to death. I mean, in retrospect, I know a lot of it was probably just the theatrics. But um, the um, the guy said, uh, you know, you and Toby went camping, huh? He he had this accent, just like Calvin Parker. Uh, I can't do it real well, but. Uh, I remember he got down in my face. I'm in bed. He got down in my face and he said, son, I know. And you know, you two knuckleheads stumbled onto something while you were out there. Didn't. Holy shit. And I didn't answer him. I didn't know how. And uh, he said, oh yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Do you think these were like the men in black that they talk about? That no, just I think know? men in black are, are from, a, I think they're with a different department. Uh, I think these were U U.S. Air Force. They showed me their credentials. They were from okay. the Office of Special Investigation. And come to find out, they did this a lot to people back in the day. But how the hell did they know? Like, how, like, you're in the middle of nowhere. You know, I don't know. I've thought about that over the years. My first thought was when we, there was a chain across the road. We took the chain down. Uh, it was just they made like a noose with a lock on it on the end mm -hmm. and it was draped around a 
post on the opposing side of the road yeah. uh, on mail. And I guess that's, you know, so park rangers didn't have to go through a bunch of keys to get in. Um, but Toby noticed that because he was on the passenger side. He's, and I'm, I was going to turn the car around. He's like, no, man, I got this. He hops out, picks up the chain and drops it. We didn't put that chain back. And I think that that was a tip off that somebody had been there. Secondly, when we left, we weren't concerned with anything other than getting out of there alive. Right. And as much distance before between us and Devil's Den as we could put. And we left the tent, Toby's backpack, uh, his nice Coleman cooler, a uh, bunch of my stuff. You left uh, it, you said? Oh, we left everything. I uh, yeah, I don't blame you. I would have been, so, been so scared. I just want a wallet and car keys. Let me in that and I'm good to go. You know. So let me ask you a question. So did you watch Encounters on Netflix? Kind of just came out. There's like four episodes of like different stories. I don't know if you saw it. You know, I, I got to be honest with you. I, I don't watch science fiction. And, uh, you know, I think it was 19, uh, or I think it was 2000 something when I finally watched uh, Independence Day. No, no, no. Th these are actual stories, though. It's like documentary kind of stuff. Oh. Yeah, these are. Oh. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't watch that either. Um, these are actual stories. But um, one of the stories, I don't remember what episode it was, but the lady said that the the guys that came to her door were she was like she thought that they were aliens posing as other people telling her to not talk about what she just experienced do you think that that's a possibility that these guys said they work for the air force they had the credentials because easy because the, they're a higher intelligence and maybe it wasn't the rope which is why they knew you were there they knew you were there because they were there Oh, yeah, they, yeah, you know, uh, no, I, I don't doubt that for a minute. I mean, I think that they can project themselves, their appearance in a way that a person will find most benign. Well, I guess they really weren't benign, but um, they, they absolutely could have been, uh, uh, to use a phrase that Neil didn't like, non-human entities. Yeah. And, and I agree with him on that. I, I I prefer to use the term extraterrestrial because that means not of this earth. Mm. But non-human entity seems to be what's popular right now. So, yeah, who knows? Yeah, you know, 2024, politically correct. Oh, hold on a second. Is that? Oh, sure. Oh, this, so they'll, they'll put it on there later. Okay, well, so I should probably ask him that. No, we could go eat something after this. I apologize. My son is here, so. Oh, Taylor? I, I have a 10-year-old. Um, He wants to order food, so I'm like. um. So when you got, when, so when all this was said and done, you went and got, x-ray is done yeah you know I'll, I'll cruise through that pretty quick but it's very important and i uh, after this incident at devil's den um i took up running you know i got out of the air force i went to civilian life i'm studying i'm not getting exercise i'm like you know i gotta do something getting fat so i started running and, and i liked it and it um you know the endorphins i uh you know, you know where I used to run? I used to love to run in the cemetery. Really? During the afternoon. Because you know what? There's no dogs, no cars. Uh, no trash, no nothing. Beautiful surroundings. Yeah. <laughs> beautiful clean. surroundings. Um, but every time I would run at about the, uh, about the two mile mark, I would get this weird itching sensation on my right leg, right over that area where they found that... Um, I'll tell you how that happened. I, I never knew that was there. Uh, never had any intention of getting it x-rayed for any reason. I had no idea. And in 
I left the state of Vermont in January of 2012 uh, for retirement and moved to Dallas, Texas here, where we have adult kids and grandkids. And uh, I woke up one morning in November of 2012 and I couldn't bear weight on my right leg. And I told my wife, you know, you got to take me to the VA, something wrong with my leg, I can't walk. So that's where the x-rays came in. They x-rayed my leg. The problem with my leg had absolutely nothing to do with that uh, cluster of objects in my calf of my leg, you know, and then above my knee, I, I think I sent you pictures. There's a, a little metal thing about the size of a fingernail with two wires attached to it. And that's above my knee and, and lateral. And uh, I had no idea they were there. And the technician takes like 24 x-rays because she can't figure out what's going on. And she, and she says, did you ever have an accident uh, where you have a foreign object in your in your leg? And I'm like, no. Yeah. And she puts this x-ray up on the x-ray screen. And you don't need to be a radiologist. If somebody points out to you and says, this, look here and look here. It's, yeah. it's plain to see. Yeah, absolutely. And when I laid eyes on that, I, a chill went up my spine and I thought, this is, this is what I got. This is my souvenir. I think I call it in the book, souvenir from 1977. And I bet it's been in there since 77, but I have no idea. They could have put, they put, could have put it in there the week before. I don't know. So you said there was some in your calf and also on your knee. What, what, what was in your calf? Uh, I sent you some x-rays. Um, if you look yeah, we're going to show it on the screen once we, uh, okay. yeah. We're in the middle of my calf muscle, mm -hmm. there's a uh, floret pattern. And the radiologist said that um, the little objects, collection of little objects, uh, look like little Tic Tacs, but they form like a flower. And he said that whatever it is, it's the consistency of bone tissue. So he says it's living bone tissue. And he said, maybe you had some kind of trauma to your, the calf of your leg. And I'm like, you know, no, bone skin, tissue? as a kid, that's all. Okay. Radiologist was also, um, you know, he wanted to know if, if I got in a fight with a radio. <laughs> he said, you know, how did you get this this uh, this thing in your leg? And I said, I don't know. I had no idea it was there. He said, well, surely you had some kind of accident. And you had something. And I said, no, I've never, never injured that leg. And he says, well, you had to because you can't violate the integrity of the skin and implant this thing in you uh, and there not uh, be a scar left. That's not possible. No scar, no cut, no opening, no nothing. nothing. Just flat skin. Nothing. Wow. And he was wigged out about that. that. I'm sure. I'm sure he was freaked out. Like, how the hell did this happen? So the fingernail one with the wires on it, right? Yes. Or it looked like a fingernail. Still there? Everything's still I'm here, there? Yes. I'm here. No, I'm saying, is it still there in your name? Oh, knees? is it still there? Oh, I'm so glad you asked me that. I'm so glad you asked me that. In November of 2017, see, I wanted, when I saw these things, I wanted them out of my body as soon as possible. I, I get this, this stuff has to come out of me. You know, I don't want it. It's not. It's like they're tracking you, right? Yes. You think they're tracking yes. you? Yeah. So I, uh, I went to see a surgeon at the VA and I said, you know, I'd like, they looked at the x-rays and said, yeah, these look pretty cool. <laughs> you know, he was interested. Uh, but he says, you know, you had a heart attack in 2005, so I'm going to need a cardiac clearance letter. You know, cardiologist has to clear you for the surgery. And it's a risk versus benefit type analysis. And, um, you know, the guy explained to me, you know, if, we take them out, there's gonna be anesthesia, there's gonna be opening of your skin, uh, there's risk of infection. And he says, you know, he says, look, I got, you know, there's 30,000 guys in this community right now that have shrapnel in them from, you know, from somewhere, from Korea, you know, from Iraq, who knows, but but they got, they got bad memories about that too. And they want that out of their system immediately. And we don't do it. 
if it's in your body and it's not hurting you, right. the standard of care in the United States is let it lie. So I had this bright idea in October of 2017. I'm gonna skip it over some stuff, but um, I called a surgeon in Tijuana because uh, they have they don't follow this standard. The right. standard of care there is different. Right. And I told this doctor, I said, look, I, I wanna I'd like to have these things removed. I sent him my x-rays and I said I'd like um, to have them remove what's called a forensic protocol. You know, like if they take a, a bullet out of somebody who's been shot, they gotta follow a, a forensic protocol for it to be evidentially sound. So the person that takes it out puts it in a little plastic or uh, cardboard box or bag and then signs it, dates it, puts the time, hands it to the next person who accepts it and signs their name, date and time. And there's a trail. There's a, 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 you know, a trail of evidence. And he said, yeah, yeah. He says, I, I'm in Tijuana. He said, I've taken lots of bullets out of people. I know how to do a forensic uh, protocol. And uh, I said, great. And he said, I, you know, I think I can do it under, uh, it might be a little uncomfortable, but he said, I think I can do it under local anesthesia. And I'm like, yeah, I'll be up for that. And uh, so we were going to set a date certain in uh, December. And I was just thrilled that I'm going to get these things out mm -hmm. and have them in my hands. And two weeks later, after I had the conversation with the surgeon, I wake up in the morning and I have at the top of my legs, there's pictures of it in the book, at the top of my leg, there are, there's a hole in each leg. Now, I never had my left leg x-rayed. I don't know why they put a hole in my leg, my left leg, uh, but it was a weird wound. It was kind of painful, but not terribly. And the wound was just crazy. I, it was about like a quarter inch in diameter. There was no blood. And I could like pull it apart and look down into my leg, down to tissue and fascia and maybe bone. I mean, it was just weird. And uh, intuitively, um, my wife's like, what's going on? How'd you get that? What happened? I'm like, I think they came and they took their merchandise back last night. I said, I think wow. these things in my leg are gone. So they it's essentially just... abducted you again. Yes. Yeah. I think they did. I wow. think they took me and, or, you know, who knows? He could have done it at the bedside, you know, make it where my wife wouldn't wake up, make Maybe. it where I wouldn't wake up. So who knows? We don't know. That's but, so crazy. Oh, my goodness. So the yeah, ones I, in your calves, a, are, the ones in your calf muscles are still there? They're still there. Yes. Wow. But the one with the wire is gone. The one with the wires is gone. Holy shit. I, I'm, I'm blown away. I am blown away. And you were supposed to go, what, within like two weeks to get it out? Yeah. In the first week of December, I was supposed to call him and we would set a date certain for me to uh, go down to Tijuana and have the surgery. One day surgery, you know, he said, you know, you might want to spend the night rather than hopping on an airplane and flying right back. Um, but yeah, he says, you know, next day you'll be good to go. You'll be sore for a week, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, because if they would have took it out and analyzed it and realized that it wasn't from this earth, maybe, or something is so far in, I mean, it would have gave you more credibility with your with your story, too, you know? It sure would have. Wow. Wow. Why do you think they picked you? Did you ever sit down and think like, maybe it's my blood type, maybe it's my uh, a genetics? My, like, what do you think it is? Do you think you were just a random pick, or I had you know I have no idea. I don't have the, or the also... slightest idea. I'm not Rh negative for my blood. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm certainly nobody special. I'm just you know an average guy and why they would choose to follow me. Um, you know, something else is uh, I should mention, and this is hard for people to believe, but I got pictures to back it up. I maybe once or twice a year, I'll, I'll see something in the sky. 
And I'll see that that shouldn't be there. Something not made at Boeing, okay? Right. Uh, a disc or something. And, you know, I was coming out of the doctor's office with my wife back in 2020. We walk into to the parking lot, and here's this lady by uh, an Altima with a key in her hand, and she's looking straight up. So I look straight up, and here's this giant silver cigar-shaped thing right over our heads. And I told my wife, I said, Sheila, look at that. And she's like, I don't see nothing. She couldn't see it. I literally was about to ask you that, Terry. She could not see it. And I don't get that. So did you ever think that maybe, because remember you said when you were on the table, it was warm because bodies had been passing through that table, right? Yes. So what if we're all getting abducted, right? Whether we're sleeping or whatever the case may be, they snap their fingers. We don't remember anything. So we can't have, we can't have these stories, but someone like you and, and the other people that email you and people all over the world, it's just something about you guys that you can remember. You know, it, it is. And there's something about my book that a, a lot of people emailed me and said, you know, um, I, I never remembered this, but as a kid, I had this happen to me. And, you know, I, I almost forgotten this, but, you know, I saw this UFO and then missing time. Missing time is another commonality. Um, right, right. So, yeah. Damn. Yeah. You know, who's to say? Somebody suggested that maybe we've all been abducted. I don't know. I think that's a little over the top. But. No, but that's what I was just saying. Maybe we we all get abducted. They're taking our DNA, whatever they're doing medically to us, right? Some people remember. Some people don't. Some people got a story to tell. Other people like me are like, damn, I I want to I want to see some aliens. I want to see what that's like. Yeah. Did you get like so? You said you had a sense of calm, but did you also, um. Was it, did you f get a sense that they were violent in any way? No, they were just all business. business. They were all business. Uh, I wouldn't call them empathetic. Um, just right to it. Just, that's it. Yeah, it's just, it's just business to them. You know, you, you, you mentioned something about, you know, we all have that hope, that feeling that, you know, I think a lot of us know that they're here. And, you know, we're just praying that they're on our side. They're benign or, you know, maybe uh, maybe help us out, you know, maybe fix climate change. Who knows? Um, there's a guy I know, uh, John Lear. Um, and he, you've heard of like Lear Jets? Yeah. Yeah. He, I think he's retired from the aviation industry, but he's on the record as saying uh, they're here and they're not our friends. Uh, and that's on, that's on YouTube. You can see that on YouTube. Why do you uh, think he said that? They're not our Why do you think he said that? You know, I think he, I don't think that's an assumption. I don't think that's a guess. You know, if you were going to guess, I think he would add the disclaimer, you know, this is my opinion. Right. Uh, but he was pretty emphatic uh, in this interview. And he said, they're here. They're, they're, they're not our friends. How do you feel about the people saying that they possibly live underneath like Antarctica? That's a thing that people are saying now that they're not, they don't even live on a different planet. They're actually here within like the inner core of the earth but they go through antarctica and then they come out and they swing around to different countries you know um there was an admiral uh admiral bird went on an expedition mm -hmm. to antarctica in yeah. 1946 and took warships and troops and it was supposedly a scientific uh, uh expedition uh, but they went down there prepared for a war. And uh, and he made this public. 
he said there were flying saucers all over the place and uh, they retreated. They turned around and went back home. Didn't he say he went through like a cave down there? And he kind of went into, you know, the earth and it was like tropical because it was like warmer inside there. Was that this? That's the same guy, right? I don't I don't remember birds saying that, but he sure could have. Um, yeah, it was around the same time. He was a pilot. And yes. he, yeah. OK, I think I think we're talking about the same guy, if I'm not mistaken. We are. Yeah. I'm so- so interesting, man. Oh, my God. You know, I had a guy, uh, I had a lot of active duty military and retired and prior military, but I had a lot of military people contact me. Uh, I had a guy who was an intelligence officer aboard the USS Princeton. In 2004, there was that Tic Tac thing uh, with the Nimitz carrier group Mm -hmm. where they had um, Tic Tac like UFOs and they had a uh, pilot, Commander Fra- Fraser, Fravor, F-A-F-A-F-R-A-V-O-R, David Fravor. Um, and he gives a description about how these things, you know, come out of the water, shoot up 80,000 feet in the sky in half a second, and just maneuver in ways that are just absolutely impossible right. for us to do. So... Do you, you believe know, that, that the U.S. government has alien bodies? Do you think they've they've captured aliens and they're just they don't they don't want to tell the people because you know obviously they don't want mass hysteria because once you see it you can't unsee it once you know you know for sure and so how you were saying you felt attacked by people I mean they would have to question humanity at that point you think that's why they want to keep this secret. You know, I think there's an element of politics involved in this. I really do. And um, the defense industry is a really, really big industry, makes a lot of money uh, and gets paid a lot of taxpayer dollars with no oversight. And do I think that there are bodies? Absolutely, I think so. And I'll tell you why is uh, there's this guy, you may have heard of him, David Grush. David Grush. Uh, was an Air Force uh, intelligence officer. He's a whistleblower now. Uh, He had 14 years in intel, uh, four years working for the UAP task force, and uh, worked for a government entity called the NRO, National Reconnaissance Office. And they got a website, nro.gov. And, you know, I didn't see any when I looked last time, but they're always hiring uh, you know, people with doctorates in physics or uh, they, they're always recruiting. Right. But he, he was there and uh, he never personally saw the bodies, but he collected the information. And, you know, that's if somebody wanted to argue, they could argue hearsay, you know, that's that's would be inadmissible in a court. Yeah. There's no pictures, there's no, there's nothing. But there are firsthand witnesses. Um, There are 17. And if if you want to, if you want your mind totally blown, um, there is a guy, Jeremy Corbell. um, And he has, um, he's made it a hobby or his life's calling. Uh, He's he's a good guy. Uh, And whistleblowers feed him. bits of, uh, of uh, footage of UFOs and all kinds of crazy stuff. And then he posts it for the world to see. So just, yeah, and David Grush said, yes, we did recover uh, flying saucers. We did recover UFOs right. that had crashed. And one of the congressmen asked him, did you recover any bi- uh, uh, biological material? And he didn't bat an eye. He said, yes. yes I did. did see that. I did see that. Yes, they were in court. Yeah. They were, well, yeah, I saw that. You know, what's curious is this guy sued um, sued the government um, through the uh, internal, uh, uh, what do you call it, Inspector General's office. 
And what's interesting was they gave this guy all kinds of crap and really treated him like hell. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they took away his security clearance because he was a whistleblower. They've since given that back, by the way. He's, oh, he has really? Yeah. I think people are fed up. I think now nowadays in 2024, most people just want to know the truth. We just want to know. Yeah, I think we deserve that. We do. We absolutely deserve that. It's like, let us just know. Who cares? There's going to be people that feel some type of way. There's going to be people that are happy to know. Can't please everybody. Just tell us the truth. You yeah. know, Mexico, did you see Mexico try to do it with like the little caskets? Did you see that? They were like, uh, they said they were uh, aliens. It came, when was that, Joe? That was like I a did couple see months that. ago. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a uh, guy from Mexico. I, I, I forget his name. Jaime is his name. Uh huh. I forget his last name, but he's famous. He's been hunting UFOs and aliens for 30 years. And uh, he found those those two bodies. They look like mummies or something. Yeah, exactly. Were were the greys that small? Oh, no, no, no. They were bigger they than were that. Three feet tall. Okay. When, when I saw this thing that Jaime um, put on TV, I got the impression it was like a child size, you know, like smaller than a gray, you know? Yeah, it was very small. But they, they sweep that under the rug so fast. I saw that for like maybe four or five days, and then it was gone. Like they took that right out of the news. Well, did you see the story out of uh, Las Vegas? I did. And the kids, um, they said they were like teenage boys, maybe young 20s. They said they had footage, they had pictures, and that was wiped completely. They came, took their phones, it was over with. Yeah. Did yeah, you see the story about, about the, the mall in Miami? That the aliens a were at the mall? No, I didn't. Look that up when we when we get off of this, look it up. Uh so many people at the mall said that there was uh what were they white, Joe? They were dark? Okay, they said they were tall, dark figures. They were at the mall in Miami. Um, there were how many people? Um, a lot of people in the mall saw them. Yeah. So there were a lot of people at the mall that saw these aliens. They said they were tall and dark. And then I would say maybe a, a hundred cop cars. Yeah, it was probably like a hundred cop cars showed up to the mall. A hundred, maybe 120. Yeah, and then they chalked it up as a teenage fight when people were coming out and saying no one was fighting. There was aliens. That's why people called the cops. Look it up. I will. I will. And that sounds Crazy. that sounds like uh, what they do. It really does sound like business as usual. They just they just flip it. And they delete videos. They delete pictures. They tell you don't say anything. They threaten families. I mean, I've 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 heard it all. They, well, you know, they, when I, go ahead. When, when I published my book in March of 2018, uh, within 30 days, my wife and I had helicopters flying over our house. And I mean, four or five times a week, always between the hours of nine and 11, because I had this big oak tree to my right in my front yard. And in the morning know, or at night? In the morning. Okay. They, yeah. 10 a.m. in the morning, between 10 and 11. Uh, could be as early as 9, but uh, yeah, within that time frame. And I went out and I thought, you know, I didn't make the connection at first. I thought, what the hell? And, and I went out and I thought, well, first thing I did was I looked up uh, the statute under the FAA um, about helicopters and uh, read all the law about helicopters. And one of the laws is that if it's a an American helicopter, it has to paint a big letter N, like in Nancy, not letter, but alphabetical character N, right. like Nancy, followed by a string of numerical characters that identify that particular vehicle. And uh, of course, I, 
I went out taking pictures of these helicopters. I blew them up and there are no markings on them whatsoever. Nothing. Uh, and then crazy at the bottom of at the bottom of the law it says exemptions uh united states military uh and certain federal agencies oh well there you go huh. there you it's go awesome. it's just so interesting to like i don't know i mean why are they keeping this secret at this point someone's gonna come out someone's gonna be like I don't have family, can't hurt my family. I don't really give a shit if I live or die. I'm putting these images out and you're just gonna have to deal with it. Like it's gonna happen one day. Oh, it is. You know? I mean, and that's coming. There are the there are yeah. 17 witnesses um that are secret. Um that are that claim that they saw with their own eyes, not a hearsay issue, but with their own eyes, uh, aliens, crafts, all. You know, they saw they saw it all. And, uh, you know, I uh, I have this on good authority that there are something like a dozen members of the United States Senate and about the same or less in the House of Representatives legislators who had who's had an experience who've had an experience. Wow. You know, like Jimmy Carter, that past president of the United States, saw a UFO over, you know, his peanut field down in Georgia. Um, so, yeah, you, I And they're agree just with sworn you. to they're secrecy. Kind of, they're just sworn to just take it to the grave. Don't say anything. I mean, it's just, it's, I don't know. At this point, it's ridiculous. It's like, it's like we already know, but like, we're just waiting for the government to say like, okay, you were right. You know, I feel like we yeah. already know anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm surprised some other country, you know, I'm surprised, you know, you know, some, you know, I don't know, pick a country, Turkey, you know, comes out and says, yeah, these things are real. We've got photographs of them. We followed them with our uh, military aircraft, but nobody's willing to do that. Well, you know, America is just going to debunk it. That's what America is good at. That's a good point. You know, right. it has to be America that comes out and, and says it through the government and really, you know, shows us pictures, let us know, you know, what's going on in depth, in depth. Because, so, uh, you know, Turkey will come out and they'll be like, please, they're still lying over there. Yeah. Fake news. Yeah. What do they just they want attention? That's what my question do. is. How do you how do you tell what kind of narrative do you give to the United States people? Because I'm telling you, I think I remember 1969. I was in uh, freshman in high school, and they put a man on the moon. I stayed home. I watched it on my black and white television. And uh, the next day, I read the uh, St. Louis Globe Democrat. And um, it said that there was a poll, I think it was by Pew, P-E-W, I mean, reputable company that conducts surveys. And something like 12% of the United States that they surveyed said, oh, that's a bunch of bunk. I think that was filmed in Arizona in the desert. So, you know, if, if there is some kind of disclosure, there's going to be pushback and there's going to be people to say, no way, it does, that's just crazy. Yeah, but that's Terry, crazy. look, it, it has to be in depth. Because let's say uh, Joe Biden right now says, you know, somebody asked him a question. Yeah, there, you know, we we have knowledge that, yeah, aliens exist. People are going to be like, ah, he's just saying that. Or, you know, maybe they do, but they're, they're it's not really that serious. They need to say in depth, this is what it is. People have not been lying we're coming out right now. We have, you know, aliens in captivity. Um, here's are the here's the different types of aliens. Like that's the only way people are actually going to be like, oh shit, this is real. You yeah. know. And I think it's going to take. I think it's going to take a generation. You know, like smoking and seatbelts. You know. Uh, yeah. Right. Nobody believed. My dad didn't believe that uh, smoking causes lung cancer and heart disease. Well, it does. Yeah. It does. You know? It does. Terry, 
thank you so much for this. Is there anything you want to add? Anything I didn't ask you? Do you want to plug your book? You want to give people your social media? Yes, I uh, I don't do a lot of social media. I had a bad experience, but I don't want to go into that. Um, I have a little website, terrylovelace.com, and my books are on there. Or you can buy them directly from Amazon. Uh, I've made an audio book. I have three books published, Incident at Devil's Den. That's the first one. Devil's Den, The Reckoning is the second one. And the third book is called Free Fall, An American Near-Death Experience. And one of these 4,400 people that contacted me, well, actually four of them, uh, had near-death experiences they wanted to tell me about and ask if I saw any parallels between their experience and, you know, alien abduction. Uh, I don't know, but they, the, the stories by the, I, I had no idea. Uh, the story that these people that had legitimate near-death experiences, it's crazy. It's wow. mind-blowing. I can't wait to read them. I'm excited. Well, thank you so much. I'm just thrilled that you asked me to come on and talk. Yes, I'm so excited to have you here. And thanks again. Please give love to your family from me. And uh, take care. Yes, likewise. Good luck with everything. Thank you. That's it for today's episode. If you like it, leave me a review, share your stories, and I might just pick a few to read on a future episode. This episode is recorded at Spotify Studios in Los Angeles. Subscribe to I Hope They're Not Listening wherever you're listening to this podcast right now, and we'll be back with more soon.